Hey, Armin here. Welcome to the NSP Nutrition Show, where we cover training, nutrition, supplementation strategies, and a whole lot more. So stand by. Welcome to the NSP Nutrition Show. I'm Armin Eckelbarger. And I'm Frank Mills. And hey, we appreciate you joining us again this week. And uh, we're getting to part two of last week's show. We talked about uh, what to know about hormone therapy. We're going to continue with that part two in the first segment of the show. And in the second part of the show, we're going to uh, ask a question. Should you always have carbs after resistance training? A lot of you are probably curious about what Armin thinks about that. So that being said, let's get right into the show. And Armin, just to pick up where we left off last week, what to know about hormone therapy part two. We really went over a lot of great information last week, and I thought it would be good. Let's do a little recap of what we went over in part one. Yeah, sure. No problem. So the, you know, the first part of the process is to you know, get your hormone levels checked so that you know mm -hmm. what you're dealing with, and, and which starts with a comprehensive blood panel analysis. And, and what you're checking is the most important hormones because there's, there's different, uh, different types of those panels too. Some can be really extensive, but the one I'm talking about is called a comprehensive male hormone panel. And that one's gonna check the key hormones uh, that mostly are gonna apply. And then it's also going to check your heart, liver, kidney, uh, mm -hmm. that, those kind of functions as well to make sure that, um, you know, the, those are staying in line. So, um, and then I went over what optimal range means when it comes to understanding mm -hmm. hormone levels. And so then I did a quick example of the protocol that I was on and, you know, what they suggested for me in that particular case, but that wasn't comprehensive. That was just a kind of a quick snapshot. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, Kind of based where we left off last week, here we are this week, part two. What would be the next important step in hormone therapy? All right, this was pretty critical as well, and that is to find the right medical professional uh, that understands what to do to bring your levels up to optimal range. And so they need to be really knowledgeable about more than just hormones, okay? They also mm -hmm. need to be knowledgeable about nutrition, supplementation, uh, your recovery, and also uh, really understanding if necessary, what prescriptions, if, if you need them, that need to be actually implemented. And there's a lot of moving parts to that area as well from what I've learned. Mm -hmm. Well, from our discussions on what you went through, trial and error, to find the right person, you know, it can be very frustrating because you can't just go get any medical doctor. You've got to get somebody, right. as you said, who truly okay. understands this. Um, what are some of the best ways that this can be done, Armin? All right. So from my own personal experience, you know, one thing you can do is you can do a search uh, for a hormone replacement therapy, HRT, or something along those lines uh, okay. in your area. So and I, I like to do that because I like to see who I'm working with and get to know the person, uh, things like that. So right. uh, when you're doing this, though, you have to read a lot of what's on their web page and find out who's actually creating the protocols and look up, look up their background because uh, everybody's going to tell you exactly what you want to hear because that's marketing. Right. But you got to right. be you got to you look a little deeper from my own personal experience. So. Uh, like things I look for is, you know, what kind of doctor is it? Who's going to be, who, who am I going to be talking with, working with on a regular basis? Uh, and mm -hmm. then um, what's their experience? And then see if you find any um, testimonials or other uh, you know, things that, that relate to what that practice does. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot to know, unfortunately, and everybody thinks they know, but um, that's why you have to do, you do your own homework and be your own advocate on that. Now, mm -hmm. secondly, you, know, you can look outside your area uh, and you can find a doctor and do something online. Now, when it comes to doing something online, here's what you need to be aware of. Some states require a, an annual face-to-face -face meeting with the doctor. 
Now, I, I'm not sure how many have relaxed that that requirement, but like Florida does require uh, one face to face with your your medical doctor a year. So it's one mm -hmm. time a year. So you, you can you know fly in and do a quick visit and fly out that kind of thing if you're if you're out of out of state. But you need to know that with each state. So it's another thing to keep in mind um, uh, because you, the reason for it is because if they prescribe testosterone, you know, that's a, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I'll think of the name of it, but it's, it's a drug that requires, it's a controlled drug. So it requires okay. stricter rules for that. Other things aren't quite as strict, so not as big a deal. It's, it's called controlled substance. So it's a controlled substance. So you need to get a prescription for it. So there are different guidelines from state to state. Okay. All right. Then third, you may want to join some of the Facebook groups or find a group that, um, you know, that talks about hormone therapy, hormone replacement therapy, things like that. So you can ask questions to those people in the groups. Now, <laughs> unfortunately, bear in mind that you're going to get a lot of information that may or may not apply. Uh, right, some of these people right. in these groups, uh, they're not, you know, they're, they're not real sharp. So just ask questions and do, do common sense with some of the responses that you get. Um, because some of these people, I mean, it's just amazing what they say, right? But it right. is a good, good place to find out what clinics they're using or what facilities are using. So you can contact them and then learn more from there. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're doing this stuff, I mean, a lot of people, um, unfortunately it costs money and you're going to have to look at how much things are going to cost, but kind of curious, what kind of cost is involved in working with a medical professional like this one, Armin? Yeah. So that's another thing that's going to vary. And that's another thing that you want to do homework on is to mm -hmm. see how they do it. Now, some of them are able to write codes and have some of the prescriptions if you needed a prescription. And I'm not saying everybody needs a prescription, but if you did, some of them right. don't have to write the code. So it can be covered by insurance at some level, whether that's for the health reimbursement account or a uh, health savings account, or there's other stipulations that, uh, that, you know, that you have to work through depending on the insurance company. Mm -hmm. And so keep that in mind because a lot of people, they want to put it on insurance. But you also need to understand that testosterone, as an example, is not very expensive. You know, and stuff typically runs about fifty dollars a month. So mm -hmm. no matter what insurance you have, you know how much is it going to really pay? So keep that in mind. Now, if you need something else, you know, a different prescription, and that would be a, a different scenario. So like right. you needed HCG right. or something, you know, or a Remedec, you know, a estrogen blocker if you really need it, which I don't recommend. But if you needed it then that would be a different fee structure that could be a little more expensive, but it could also be covered under insurance, so, but that's kind of not common. So mm -hmm. typically it's, it's paying out of pocket. So other things that will come up is you're going to have, you know, a, a, you know, once you do one set of lab work, you're going to need to recheck. So typically they want to recheck your labs about every six to eight weeks to make sure that things are starting to dial in. Mm -hmm. So you'll have some, lab work now the thing is when they do lab work they're only going to need to check what's not optimal they don't need to check everything again because it doesn't make any sense they just check those things that they're trying to improve and bring into optimal range so it, mm -hmm. it won't be as expensive so don't let don't let a medical office tell you you got to run all the same blood work again because that's that's not true so okay again, something you want to keep, keep in mind uh, then you have the reeval which can be every six months to a year once they get you dialed in. So they always charge a, a fee for that, whether it's online or in, in an office. And that can range from $100 to $200 every time for mm -hmm. that evaluation. Okay. Then whatever, if you didn't need a prescription, you'll have the cost of prescriptions if you can't get it covered by insurance. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind. So that's, that's your fee there. And then um, if you, if they recommend doing, you know, a gel or pellets or injections, et cetera. Um, there's going to be, um, you know, different therapy strategies and costs. So for example, if you have a doctor that's really into pellets, which I don't recommend, but just mm -hmm. my own personal views, uh, that's going to be a lot more expensive. So that's much more expensive than doing other type of therapy where you're maybe just doing, you know, subcutaneous injections or 
using a gel. So mm-hmm. you got to keep that in mind. Um, so there's, as you can tell, a lot of moving parts. Like for me, mine range is about $150 a month for what I need. So, you know, that's an example. So it's not okay. horribly expensive, but at the same time, that's, that's why you need to shop around and look because some of them are charging a lot more than that because they, they know they can get it. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> okay. Well, I guess another question I have here for you, Armin, is, you know, how complicated would you say that implementing these protocols are? I mean, does it depend on the person? Yeah. Well, what it's going to really depend on, you know, is the labs. So if you got a okay. lot, lot of things that are out of, that are out of sync, mm-hmm. that's going to be a little more involved. Okay. But typically you may only have a few things that are out of sync. And so it's a lot easier to implement. So if you just have low testosterone, and your estrogen's good, and your sex binding hormone, hormone globulins are good, then you may just need to see what your DHEA sulfate reading and your pregnenolone are. And you may just need mm-hmm. to do that, and then maybe some HCG to help keep the testicles working, but also get them to produce more testosterone. HCG is human chorionic gonotropin, uh, but it does work. Or you could do clomiphene, which, again, these are used for fertility purposes, but they do mm-hmm. increase your level of testosterone naturally so that's another alternative so not real complicated Mm -hmm. uh, from from that perspective uh from a medical perspective then we'll also we'll talk more about from the nutritional and supplement perspective Mm -hmm. but um yeah that's what i'm kind of talking about there well i'm kind of curious can you give us maybe some more examples of the protocols and the things that maybe you've experienced yeah, well, uh, again, it it, get, it varies by doc, doctor and what they really, mm-hmm. really know. So, right. you know, and I've, I've been through different approaches. Um, and, you know, when I first started this particular doc, this particular uh, medical group, they uh, put me on testosterone, uh, DHEA, and a Nasrazole, which is an estrogen blocker. Right, um, right. And then, so that therapy worked to a point, but that wasn't really the best therapy for me as I learned more. Mm -hmm. So things started to evolve because they never checked my pregnenolone level. So the next doctor, you know, like, again, I just, I didn't like this doctor wasn't working out. And also this doctor tried to get my testosterone too high, which was not beneficial and not what I asked for, but that's what I thought I would want because I weight train. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for age management, I'm looking for vitality, I'm looking for long-term. So the next doctor uh, was pretty knowledgeable uh, that they put me on pregnenolone and it helps with the hormone precursors. Uh, and then because of the amount of DHEA, DHEA that was being produced, I didn't need to even take any DHEA in that case. But then they also put me on HCG, so they kept the testicles working so that wouldn't, I wouldn't have to take quite as much uh, testosterone and I thought I was taking a lot but it can help keep your dosage down which right. is also a good thing so and then after analysis of my thyroid you know they determined my T3 and T4 which we talked about on the last last episode they weren't mm-hmm. converting over very well so then they put me on a natural desiccated um, thyroid stimulant which was armor uh, and one thing that I would say that I was told by different doctors and different medical professionals is they prefer the ones that are into it prefer to use armor first because it's natural uh, form of uh, stimulant versus going to the synthetic thyroid stimulants Mm because they said that the synthetic tend to affect the gland a lot harsher than the natural desiccated everybody's different on this but you know so my understanding is start with the natural one if that doesn't work then you can always go to the synthetic and just understand it's going to be a little harder on the gland. So mm-hmm. you want longevity, that's what you got to take into account with that. And then, you know, later, and then I you know, got with another medical group because, uh, you know, the other things didn't work out with the other one. And then, um, you know, they changed up my testosterone dosaging, which made sense. Uh, they broke it up. And then we, instead of doing a shot once a week, then they just, they, you know, and I did some research as well, mm-hmm. found out it's better to do a subcutaneous shot. So you do it you know, once or you do it like two times a week for what the dosage I was taking. And that's a little bit more stable for your body. So you don't need an estrogen blocker. So okay. that was great news because then I could come off of that 
And because what I found out is an estrogen blocker can affect your IGF-1 readings, which is your growth hormone. So that's not something you want to do long term. Mm -hmm. The reason they use an estrogen blocker is because they don't want you to get um, gynomastia, which is called, also called bitch tits. But mm -hmm. that's kind of kind of overstated. So because there's okay. natural ways to to affect your estrogen level. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also they, one group wanted me to try the peptides to help improve my IGF-1 because the all had pulled it down. And I did that. And then only I did was make my wallet a lot lighter. So <laughs> you need to make sure right. you're, you're <laughs> checking these things. So once you go check your IGF-1 and then you use these peptides for a period of time, then you go back and check. If it's not going up, you're absolutely wasting your money. So I mm -hmm. found a better product um, later on that's just a gel that I use and then you use it twice, use it in the morning and in the evening. And that brought my IGF one back into a better range. So, uh, and then I'm off, you know, I didn't have to take the blocker anymore because I'm using natural uh, supplements to uh, help with my estrogen level. I know that's a kind of a mouthful and a lot wow. of stuff, but um, <laughs> there you go. Well, <laughs> it sounds like you learn a whole lot, especially from the prescription side of things for sure. But, uh, what about the natural side or maybe the natural things, uh, you know, that are out there that you learned? Yeah, I would really suggest people go with that route first um, and then see how you respond by having lab work. And if it's mm -hmm. not responding, then, then you may, you may con you probably need to consider the other. Um, but I would start there. So one of the things you can help your hormone levels that's free and cheap is fasting. Fasting for a full 24 hours or even a three-day fast can really perk up your hormone levels. Well, that's good news because that helps to burn more fat and it's free. Then cost mm -hmm. anything plus you, you save money on food. So right, first right. and foremost, I'd, I'd really suggest you start looking at that because too much food can affect your hormones. Okay? Right, I mean, right. it affects everything with too much food. So that's one. Obviously, your nutrition you need to eat fats in your diet and you need some uh, saturated fat. Mm -hmm. People think that fat is bad. No. Hormones need cholesterol to rebuild cells. And your body makes about 3,000 milligrams of cholesterol a day. Okay. So I tell you that there's a need for it. So you, but you need to also keep taking in fats because your demands are higher, especially if you're training. So that's one of the things I had to learn is, you know, a low fat diet is not good for hormones. Um, and there's plenty of research to, to validate that. So you need protein and you need fat in your diet. Some of it can be saturated. It could be other fats as well, but they need mm -hmm. to be quality. Okay. And so we're not talking about trans fat or these, these vegetable oils, these other crappy, you know, types of fat that are out there. And then you, you got to understand supplementation. One thing that can help your testosterone is having zinc. 50 milligrams of zinc the night before you go to, you know, before you go to bed can help with your testosterone production. That's why oysters, which are high in zinc, uh, you know, long ago, they used to make fun of having oysters and, you know, feeling all right as an example. Right. Okay. So you have zinc and then you have uh, other herbs like Tonkat Ali, Badoji Agressi. Uh, these things are naturally uh, ways to stimulate more testosterone production. Now, Tonkat Ali actually just, it suppresses sex binding hormone globulins. And what that means is it frees up your free testosterone a lot more. So that you you feel a difference. So that's what Tonga okay. Ali really does. Okay. Doji Agressi, that's one that can actually make the testicles bigger. So it's a and you gotta, you know, again, do your research on these types of uh, supplements. Okay, but that's another one that can help. Ashwagandha can help. It also can help with sleep. Astragalus is another one. So you, you got a you know a whole different combination. So like you know, the NSP nutrition alpha male has a lot of the stuff in it. So that's a product if you want something that has it all kind of combined that's mm -hmm. another consideration you might want to make so just keep that in mind and then the other thing is you got to get sleep if you don't get enough sleep right. your hormones are going to take a hit big time uh so you need to focus on getting eight eight hours of sleep and make sure you get the good deep sleep and the REM sleep mm -hmm. and then lastly lastly taking prescription medications is going to affect your hormone levels so understand the side effect if you're taking a statin drug to the manager cholesterol, which I think you need to do more research on, that's going to affect your hormone levels in a negative way. It's not going to be in a positive way. 
All right, so that's kind of my long-winded one on, wow. uh, on the cell phones. <laughs> no, but there, there's a lot of them out there to try naturally first before you have to go to that next level or if you have to go exactly. to that next level. Right, okay. So I'm just kind of curious, how long have you been dealing with optimizing hormones and what are some of the changes that you know, you've know you seen over the years regarding these protocols? Yeah, so I got started at the age of 48 um, because I had learned about hormones and was getting my levels checked. And at that time, my total testosterone was uh, 430. Uh, and then my free testosterone was fairly low. So, you know, the doctor I was dealing with at that time obviously encouraged me to start therapy. I probably didn't need to with what I know now, but that doesn't matter. Right, so I made right. the decision to do that. And then I've kind of learned as, I, as I've gone what things work and what doesn't work and then understanding the complexity of it when things, you know, when your lab results come back. So right. I'm on less than half of the dosage on testosterone than when they first started me. And I'm right in, right in the sweet spot of eight, 850 to 900 uh, for optimal range. But I am hmm. taking, you know, the normal dose is 200 milligrams a week and I'm, a, I'm on less than 80. So this goes to show you, you need to do homework if you're going to take the, the, the road down doing a prescription external uh, testosterone treatment. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's one thing. But also because I do the HCG and I do the other supplements, it's keeping my body making testosterone. So that's another reason why I, I need to take less. And also I got my fats a lot higher. You know, I didn't have mm -hmm. my fats high when I first started. But once I started getting my fats higher, that also improved my, my readings because I had to ask the one doctor, I go, you know, I'm doing everything the same, but my testosterone keeps coming up. He goes, that's because you got more fat in your diet. And I'm just like, wow. And I wish I'd have known that a while back. So, mm -hmm. But then the good news was I could, you know, I just had adjusted back. So that's great. And that's what's important. So I'm kind of curious. We went over a lot of information. What would you say is the most well, let's just say important thing or important things that, you know, someone should know regarding this topic. Well, first and foremost, you need to be your own advocate, taking responsibility and learning as much as possible. Just don't, mm -hmm. don't be trusting the doctors to know what they're doing. Unfor Cause unfortunately right. they, they don't really know. And that mm -hmm. may sound harsh, but that's reality at this point. Now it's getting better, but. Uh, you need to do your own homework, in my opinion, or talk to somebody like me or somebody that's experienced it, that's getting good results and probably not taking a lot less than other people are taking mm -hmm. uh, and proceed with caution. Uh, make sure you understand everything you're doing it and why. And also make sure you're going to do the natural approach first and foremost before you start moving into the other, because it's a long term decision. When you start right. taking external testosterone, that's not like you're going to take that for a couple of weeks and you're done. You know, that's kind of a long term decision. So understand that and understand that less is probably going to be better, but you need to have it, you need to be, it needs to be done in a way that gets you the effect. So, like some doctors, they'll prescribe testosterone one injection every two weeks. Well, testosterone only lasts in your system for seven days. So, if you're taking it every two weeks, you're never going to get what you need to make you feel better. So, that's another thing doctors don't know. Mm -hmm. but the reason they, 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 uh, they do it that way because when you read the bottle, it says, uh, you know, one injection every two weeks on the bottle because that's for people that suffer from anemia. So understand, you just don't take testosterone one shot every two weeks. Besides that, it's just going to increase your estrogen. And it's not going to make you feel the way you want to feel, which gives mm -hmm. you more energy, make you feel better. So I mean, right, that's a kind right. of a quick one there. You need to understand in your lab results, you know, what DHT is and have that reading done. DHT is dehydrotestosterone. If that starts getting elevated, it can affect your hair, which can cause your hair loss. It can also affect uh, your prostate. So that's another thing that you, you want to be tracking. Uh, and then if you do have elevated DHT, uh, if they want to prescribe Propecia to you for mm -hmm. to reduce the hair loss or finasteride, another name for it, you want to look at all your options because that can cause you to lose your libido. So what good is that going to do? Okay. So, you know, there's other things you can do for <laughs> DHT, like cut, cut your testosterone back. Okay. Right. And, and then help your hair loss. And also if you had that issue, 
there's you need to take shampoo to wash the DHT out of your hair because even if you take a blocker like that, like we talked about Propecia, that's mm-hmm. not going to get out of your hair. You got to wash it out with a special shampoo, which I learned that the hard way. So wow. there you go. Uh, estrogen okay. blockers uh, don't recommend them. So try to split your dose up two to three times a week, small dosage, so that you don't re- jack up your estrogen. Mm-hmm. You can take natural estrogen blocker like calcium deglucarate or uh, cruciferous vegetable extracts, which help to manage estrogen. So those are natural supplements that are fairly inexpensive, and you, it's not going to cause you the other issues that you would get by taking Nasrazole or Remedex, which is what typically is prescribed. Um, but when you get your testosterone, you know, some of them want to recommend DECA to be added to it because it's supposed to help your joints, supposed to make your joints feel better. Okay, well, DECA can also cause your libido to drop. So is that what you really need? Okay, so you got to do your homework on it. Okay, is that something that, and get all the details from these doctors, ask a lot of questions. What's the side effect? They don't tell you this stuff. You got to ask. Right. They're not going to tell right. you. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, is splitting up the dose of testosterone, not trying to take one shot per week, because all that does is it gives you, you know, it gives you one big surge of testosterone in your system and it's going to slowly dissipate over the seven days. But when you take a large dose like that, well, not, not necessarily a large dose, but you take a dose like that that's concentrated, that causes your estrogen to rise up. So when you split it out over two or three days you know, during the week, then your estrogen doesn't come up. So that's more manageable and much more effective gotcha. too. You feel, gotcha. you feel a lot better. So I've kind of been through the whole spectrum on this. So, <laughs> Well, a lot of great information, both last week and this week, and we're kind of getting uh, at the end of the segment, anything you'd like to add? Any final thoughts? Well, uh, here's a key thing. Okay. As we age, hormones are going to decline. It's just, uh, it's a matter of time. So what you want to do is be on the offense, get your levels checked, and then make the nutritional supplement changes as you notice things starting to drop so you can bring them back up. So start that route because uh, optimizing your hormones is important because hormones are the messengers that tell your body how to function. So that's why you feel bulletproof typically at 20, 30 years of age. You know, you can take on the world because your hormones right. are really high. So unless you're suffering from, you know, lack of hormones, that's a different story. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of benefits to it. It's going to help your energy. It's going to give you that longevity you're looking for. Um, I mean, it's going to make you feel better and look better and other and a lot of other things. And I would also, if you're on therapy, I would really suggest you do resistance training to help utilize it better. Resistance training helps to push the, the, the hormones into the cells better. So mm-hmm. if, you, if you're not going to exercise and you do therapy, it may not be what you think it's going to be. You, you really want to exercise weight training to get really the great benefits from it because it does incorporate everything in the cells much better. Uh, and other than that, you got to find the right people to work with. Really poor. So anyways, not trying to overkill, but uh, no, there you go. No, you're, you're a- absolutely right. You know, um, well, we appreciate all that information. And if you have any questions or comments on the hormone therapy, please leave a comment in the comment section in YouTube, or you can send us an email at support at nspnutrition.com. We'll get that. And if we have to follow up on any questions or comments on the show, we'll be glad to do that. All right. So that's the end of the first segment. Stand by from a quick bird from NSP nutrition and Armin and I will be right back. Hey, and welcome back to the NSP Nutrition Show. I'm Armin Echelbarger. And I'm Frank Mills. And as promised, we're going to talk about, uh, well, actually, we're going to ask the question. Should you have carbs after resistance training? A lot of people uh, are going to argue this. Pro, con, a lot of stuff there. So let's talk about having carbs regarding after you train. Armin, what's the purpose of this? Okay, good question. Uh, what you're trying to do after you get done training, you've broken down muscle. So one thing you do need is protein because you need the amino acids to start the repair process. Mm-hmm. So 
what the carbohydrates can do because you've depleted the body, the muscles of glucose, you're going to replenish them with some more carbohydrates. The thing is, is you don't eat as many as you think, but when mm-hmm. you do it this way, uh, you're going to get better recovery and you have better energy later on in the day because you've replenished things. And again, it's kind of a learning process of what's going to work for you and not work for you. But I would say that if you're lean and you're not looking to lose a lot of body fat, that uh, using carbs after you train is going to help you. Well, you know, the word carbs seems like a bad word out there right now uh, because nobody wants them um, unless they have to have them or, you know, depending on your nutrition plan. But does it matter what type of carbs you use? Yeah, you're going to you're going to get a lot of debate on that one, too. So, you know, some people feel like you don't want to have an insulin spike. That's not good for you. And I agree, if you're eating a lot of carbs throughout the day, you're spiking mm-hmm. your insulin two or three times a day, that's not good. I would agree. But when it comes to getting the right result from your training and to replenish your muscles, I'm a bigger fan of the high glycemic carbs because an insulin spike will come up and then push the nutrients into the cells and drop right back down. So if you've been low carb, then you're going to start burning fat again as soon as the insulin drops right back down. So that's why I like to use the high glycemic carbs, because if you use the slower burning, lower glycemic carbs, they're going to keep your insulin hanging around longer because they burn slower. Mm, So that's one of the reasons I don't like using those. I'd rather do the high glycemic, get the insulin spike, and then it'll drop back down uh, from that perspective. So as it's burning carbs, you're not burning fat, correct? Yeah, you're not going to burn fat when your okay. insulin's elevated. It's, it's right. It's a, it, it doesn't work that way. Now, okay. some people want to argue that for some reason, but you just look it up. <laughs> okay. Insulin, okay. Insulin is a fat storage hormone. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So why would somebody not want to have carbs after training? Let's just say, I don't want carbs after training. Why would somebody do that? So for, from my perspective and things I've learned is, you know, if you're trying to lose body fat, then you're going to probably want to forego the carbs because you're trying to lean out. And it, here's the reality. The reality is, and some people disagree with this, but you know, look it up. 50 to 60% of the protein you ingest is going to convert to glucose anyways. Okay. So you're going to get some, you're going to get some carbohydrates indirectly just from your protein. So the body kind of takes care of itself from that regards. So uh, you know, people are thinking, well, you got to have them for better recovery. You got to have them for energy. That's not necessarily the case because I've done it both ways. And when you're preparing for a contest, you're leaning out, you're not having carbs after you train because you're trying to deplete the glycogen as much as you can. Because mm-hmm. uh, when you get ready to carbohydrate load, you want, you want to replenish it the right way. So that's another thing as well. Okay. So is there a certain amount of carbs that you should take? Yeah, and that's going to vary too, depending on the person. Okay. So what I'm doing, you know, after post workout, I'll typically target 15, no more than 30 grams of carbohydrate. If I start taking more than that, I notice my stomach's starting to smoothen out. So that's how I regulate how many, how many carbohydrates, carbohydrates I'm going to take in. And mm-hmm. you don't need as many as you may think. I mean, some of these people, this like you know, 50 to 100 grams of carbs. Right. Well, right. you got to, if you have any excess, it's just going to go to the fat cell. And then that's why you got to do cardio to burn off that excess. Uh, it's in your system. Okay. So why, why take in more than you need? Right. So, and again, and if they're high glycemic, then they're going to get utilized pretty quickly to go into the areas that are depleted the way you need. So that's the muscle cells and the, and the liver. So, um, you know, that's, that's what I do. Okay. So you said you like high glycemic carbs. Can you give us uh, an example of the ones that you like after training? Yeah, and again, that's going to be you know a person's own personal taste buds, but uh, right, right. I like uh, a really good one is a as a ripe banana. You know, a banana that's hmm. kind of slightly brown, it's got some you know brown dots on it, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's going yeah. to be a high glycemic banana. Now, a banana that's just really gr- that's green or really yellow is not high glycemic. Okay. So the softer and mustier the banana, the more glycemic it's going to be. So that's hmm. one thing. Pineapple is high glycemic. Watermelon is high glycemic. And it's also a fruit. So you enjoy some fruits if you want. 
uh, white potatoes. So if you're, if you're doing something in the evening and you're carb loading after training, have some mashed potatoes, have a baked mm. potato, you know, that kind of stuff. Again, I'm not talking French fries here and other things right. like that. I'm talking, I'm talking <laughs> right. you know, natural high glycemic carbs, right. uh, sticky white right. rice, uh, rice cakes, uh, grits, if you're having, you know, morning corn, peas, pasta, pancakes, uh, again, nationally made not the store stuff right. or prepackaged right. uh quality breads like cornbread zucchini bread nut bread i mean there's a lot of good things you can use that are high right. that get the job done and you can enjoy yourself <laughs> and taste good right right all right so we've covered uh a lot of information here of course this is the nsp nutrition show so we're going to talk about supplements what about supplements well there's Obviously, when it comes to reloading your glucose, there's other different strategies for simplicity, mm-hmm. and that would be having something prepackaged. So you're going to have different glucose replacement uh, powders. Uh, there are some other drinks, too, but uh, what they're going to contain is malfodextrin, okay. dextrose, waxy maize is another one, or even a product called carbolin, which is a combination of all these high glycemic carbs like potatoes and rice and all that kind of formulated into a formula to absorb really rapidly uh, as you mix it with water or some other fluid uh, Mm -hmm. to take it. So those are kind of the most common ones you're going to see that, and again, they're going to have more glucose oriented replacement than fructose. Right. So that's another reason you're you're not going to have as much fructose, which is a good thing because fructose, if you get too much of it, it's not good for the capillaries. Hmm. Um, and the other thing you could do is, you know, if you're doing a post-workout shake, you can just add these powders, uh, into the, into the shake and, you know, shake it up and then you've got your carbohydrate intake. So nice. those are some, okay. of the, some of the simple ones that, um, that I'm familiar with. Uh, but again, you gotta read that label, see how many carbs is in it. Cause you know, some of them, you know, like carb blend, it's like 40 or 50 grams of carbs just in one scoop. So. You know, take a third scoop or a fourth scoop. You don't need all that. Plus, it mm-hmm. goes a lot longer if you did that. Also, you know, same thing in your mouth of dextrose and your dextrose. Just look at the, um, you know, the amount that you need to use for what you want to use it for. But it can help you if you're in a hurry. You know, if you need something mm-hmm. quick. Well, a lot of great information. Any final thoughts to wrap up the segment? Yeah. So, you know, I've experimented with a lot of different types of, uh, you know, high glycemic carbs and then supplement powders myself. Uh, so you kind of have to play with it and see how you respond. Right. Uh, but you really want to pay attention to how your body responds. So, you know, if, if you're feeling stronger, you're feeling like your recovery is good, you don't have as much muscle soreness. It's another thing mm-hmm. to kind of keep in mind. It can help reduce that. Uh, then that means that you're, you're being where you need to be on it. But if you notice that your muscularity and your, and your, and your definition is starting to smooth out, you know, Basically, that just means you're getting too many carbs. You need to cut it back because you're mm-hmm. overloading and it's just being stored as fat. So, and again, you could be nitpicking here a little bit, but at the same time, the way I do this, and it works well for me and my clients, uh, it, you get a better response and you don't have to do extra work to burn off the excess body fat that's accumulated by doing by just taking in too much. Well, Armin, a lot of great information, um, man, and a terrific show, both last week to go with part one and part two, but, you know, to wrap up uh, a really great show. And thanks a lot for the information. Uh, no problem. I hope you guys got some good takeaways on this one. Uh, you may want to have questions. That's fine. I mean, I would. There's a lot to know here, but, uh, you know, we'll do what we can to answer for you. And uh, But I am looking forward to the next show. And, Let us know if you got questions or you got something else you want us to talk about. And if you do have questions, you know, as I said earlier, the best way to do it is to leave a comment right there on YouTube, or you can email us directly at support at nspnutrition.com. We'll get your question and who knows, maybe uh, your question will be the topic of a new show. You never know. But uh, Armin and I appreciate you joining us today. And check back next week for another brand new episode of the NSP Nutrition Show. Hey, thanks for checking out the NSP Show. Go to nspnutrition.com where you can find a whole heap of resources to help you achieve stunning definition and eye-popping levels of muscularity. Don't forget you can save 10% on your first order by using the code NSP Show at the checkout. Catch you next time.